Chapter 24 deals with pathogenic DNA viruses. We do separate the viruses out when we study the viruses and which diseases they cause, etc., into the two different groups, DNA versus RNA viruses. The DNA uh, pathogenic viruses are grouped into seven different families. They are based on several different factors. Uh, number one, what type of DNA do they have? Is it double-stranded or is it single-stranded? Remember, in most biology courses, you learn that DNA is always double-stranded, but viruses are different. Number one, they never read your biology book. They don't care what's in your biology book, so they don't know. They're supposed to all be double-stranded. There are some that are single-stranded. Uh, there is one family, the Heptadena veridiae, that contains both double-stranded and single-stranded DNA. They will also be grouped depending on whether there is an envelope. They'll be de uh, grouped depending upon their size and what is the host cell that they attack. We're going to stop start with the Pox veridiae. These are double-stranded DNA viruses. All the ones we talk about in this chapter are DNA. Uh, this family does have the viruses. They do have a complex capsid. They do have envelopes. They're very large in terms of viruses. They can infect many different mammal species. Most of the animal pox viruses are species-specific, though. Um, some of them cannot in fact, humans, why? Because remember, there has to be a receptor on the human cell that allows for the virus to attach before it can even penetrate the cell. So there's some specificity there. Uh, for the pods, for the, most of them, the infection is, uh, the mode of entry is due to inhalation of the viruses. You typically have to have close contact. Uh, one of the main diseases with smallpox, they tend to produce, uh, pox viruses tend to produce lesions as it progresses through various stages, and that's part of where it gets its name from. So you can see on this picture of electron microgram, because remember you've got to have electron microscope in order to see the, the viruses, they are so small. This is considered large in terms of relative size for viruses, but you can definitely see uh, that it does have an envelope. It does have a large capsid around it. In terms of the stages of the lesions that's going to be formed, if we're looking at a cross section of the skin, first you get kind of a little bit of a swelling, uh, which is called the macule, reddening to the area, and then increased swelling that's the papule. Now you finally, in third stage, get a vesicle that's formed that has fluid in it. It's raised. You definitely see it. Uh, it will be sore to the touch because that vesicle with the fluid in it is taking, obviously, up space. The skin is stretching around it. It's pressing against some of the nerves. You tend to have the vesicle recede a little bit, and that vesicle becomes filled with pus, and that's referred to as the pustule. You get a crust formation on the surface of the skin, and then you're left with a scar. Now this all takes, obviously, time. Smallpox, uh, it's commonly known as variola. There are two different forms of it, variola major, variola minor. Minor obviously caused a more minor form of the disease. It would infect internal organs. It would cause fever, tiredness. The virus would move uh, in the blood to the skin. On the skin, it produces the pox. Uh, and then would leave those resulting scars. This is a picture. Uh, you can see all of the, the lesions formed by the virus. Once again, the smallpox. Smallpox is the first disease to have become eradicated. It was eradicated in the late 1970s. 
Why were we able to eradicate it? Number one, we were able to come up with a vaccine that was fairly stable and inexpensive, so it was easy to produce and administer. There are no other animal reservoirs. It was just human, so you don't have to worry about the virus essentially hanging out in some other animal. Uh, symptoms develop very quickly when you become infected, and so it was easy then to very quickly quarantine to help prevent the spread of it. You do not have a carrier state, or basically anyone who has a disease would develop uh, some degree of those lesions. So you don't have anyone who's asymptomatic. The spread is by close contact. So this has been a success story with the vaccination program and eradicating it. Uh, I will say this, there have been some stocks of the virus that have been maintained. Initially, there were five stocks that were maintained. The decision amongst scientists was to not um, basically eradicate the stock supplies. Once it's gone, it's gone. That's it. You, you can't bring it back. And so there were five stocks, including the United States and Russia and three others, that have been maintained. Uh, there has been some concern with the fall of the Soviet Union as to what happened to that, their stock of the smallpox. Have they been able to account for the whereabouts of that? And there are some people who say yes, some people who say no. The concern is if it were to fall into the, fall, the wrong hands, could that potentially be used then as a form of bioterrorist weaponry? Because it has been eradicated, the general public is no longer vaccinated against it. Why receive a vaccine for something that does not exist? And so they did stop the vaccination program. So some of us who are older, uh, I'm not saying I'm old, but some of us who are older do remember being vaccinated against smallpox. The younger generation is not. Now, the military still does. Um, but in terms of just general health care, etc., this has been a success story that we, they were able to eradicate it. Like I say, there were several factors that played a role in that. They've been working on trying to eradicate some other diseases, as we'll talk about. Um, but as of yet, we have not been successful. It gets harder when, say, you, you throw in there another animal reservoir where it can hang out, or you throw in vectors, you throw in having individuals who are asymptomatic who could be acting as carriers, infecting others unintentionally. That makes it harder than to control. Another uh, type of pox virus, we're all within this family, pox viridiae, is Molluscopox pox virus, which does cause a skin disease. You tend to have these smooth, waxy papules. Um, it tends to be spread by contact with an infected individual. Uh, it can be transmitted uh, between individuals who are sectic sexually active. Uh, treatment's going to be involved removing that infected uh, nodule. If you have a normal immunity, normally you heal fine without any treatment. And this shows uh, the lesions that are formed by it. There are some other pox virus infections that occur in other animals. And in order for it to be transmitted to humans, you would have to have contact with the infected animal. So even if it does happen, it's usually a very mild type of infection. Edward Jenner used cowpox when he was trying to come up with his vaccination uh, regimen. He used cowpox to immunize individuals against smallpox. Herpes viridae is a linear, double-stranded DNA virus. They do have uh, envelope capsid. <coughs> the virus envelope has to fuse with the cell membrane in order to gain entry into that host cell. Uh, 
This is one of your most common uh, DNA viruses. It often can be latent or dormant where it remains inactive in the infected host, so it affects the host and it just kind of hangs out there. And then it can be reactivated later on and then you have a recurrence of the disease. The different species of it, even though we often don't necessarily talk about species per se with viruses or different strains, uh, they'll use HHV and then a number. And the numbers indicating the order that they were discovered. So, humans, human herpes virus 1 and 2 often will cause skin lesions, uh, very slow spreading. Once it used to be known as herpes simplex, uh, but now it's human herpes virus 1, human herpes virus 2. After that primary infection, then once again, the viruses, as I said, they can remain dormant or latent is the term we would use. And they remain latent in the ganglia, the nerve, and then can be reactivated later on. So this is showing some of the sites where the herpes virus can remain uh, where it can become infected and then remain latent. Types of infections caused by HHV1 and HHV2, oral herpes, genital herpes, ocular herpes, Whitlow, and neonatal herpes. Oral herpes, uh, typically the human herpes virus 1, or HHV1 can cause uh, what's known as fever blisters or cold sores in the oral cavity that can cause infections along the gum line. It can also cause infections in the pharynx. And here is an example of oral herpes lesions. Genital herpes, HHV causes the majority of these. These tend to be very painful lesions. They're on the genitalia. Uh, they can also cause oral lesions if, and be transmitted uh, by oral sex. Here's an example of the lesions, genital herpes. Ocular herpes, uh, this is infection with the eye. Usually it's just one eye that's going to be infected. And the symptoms, oftentimes the eye uh, may be more sensitive to light. It's going to have some pain. It has kind of a gritty feeling to it. Uh, you need to be careful that you don't uh, cause lesions on the cornea. So here's an example. Whitlow is when you have a, a blister that becomes inflamed on the finger. It can be caused by HHV1 or HHV2 when it's entering the skin. That's the point of entry. Um, this tends to be more common in children and also, unfortunately, it's healthcare workers. Because you can see the inflammation and swelling and lesions on the finger. Neonatal herpes. Most babies become infected during birth. This infection can be severe. A newborn's immune system is not 100% working yet, and so any infection is going to be more severe in the newborn. <coughs> they will usually try to, uh, if they know the mother is infected, uh, then they may consider doing a C-section versus having a natural childbirth to prevent the infection passing from the mother to the child. There are a couple of other type of herpes simplex infections that can occur, such as encephalitis, meningitis, pneumonia, often seen more in immunocompromised individuals. So here's comparing uh, the HHV1 versus HHV2, comparing the mode of transmission, the latency, where is it hanging out, where do you see the lesions, and other types of complications that may appear. In terms of the epidemiology and pathogenicity of it, the active lesions are the source for the infection. Um, now, asymptomatic carriers can shed the HHV2 genitally. Transmission usually occurs through close body contact. Um, if you have cracks or cuts in the mucous membranes, it can gain entry. Uh, the virus can spread cell to cell. 
<laughs> HHV1 infections can occur, uh, be transmitted by casual contact with children. And most of your HHV2 infections will occur between ages of 15 and 29 from sexual activity. In terms of diagnosis, usually the lesions are very uh, helpful in making that diagnosis. Uh, infections. Infections can be treated somewhat with uh, various drugs. It can help limit how long the lesions are going to last, and it can reduce the amount of virus shedding. You don't cure the disease or eliminate the virus, but you can reduce the amount of time that you would be considered contagious. Prevention. Uh, for healthcare workers, use gloves. You should always be wearing gloves anyway when you are working with patients, but certainly this, this could help reduce the chance uh, or reduce the risk of contracting it from your patient. And then sexual abstinence uh, and prevent safe sex, sex practices with someone who is infected. Human herpes virus 3, once again, it's within this whole large family of the herpes viridae family. This is also known as varicella zoster virus. There's two different diseases that are caused varicella, which is commonly referred to as chickenpox, and then herpes zoster, which is commonly referred to as shingles. Chickenpox used to be considered one of those quote-unquote childhood diseases. It was seen more often in children and adults of very severe, uh, much more severe illness in ad adults than it would be in children. Shingles used to think of it as in older adults. Um, unfortunately, we are seeing younger and younger people develop shingles. Chickenpox is very, very infectious. The virus enters the skin through usually the respiratory tract, but can also be through the eyes. From the site of infection, it can get in the blood and travel throughout the entire blood. Your classic skin lesions, those pox, typically were, will appear about two to three weeks after the infection. The incubation time period is 21 days. Like I said earlier, the, the disease is relatively mild in children as compared to adults. Uh, Usually the pox will first be seen on the scalp and it tends to move from the top of the body down. <coughs> the pox, just so you know, can't appear anywhere. Um, I know my, to give you an idea as to how contagious it is, my younger brother, uh, when he was about 18, was working um, in a video store that time, nobody had their own videos. You went to a store, you rented them, and he worked there. Well, apparently somebody had chicken pox came in. Anyway, he contracted it. He had the pox down his uh, esophagus, down his throat. Very, very painful. So the, the pox can occur anywhere. The virus can remain latent or dormant in the nerves and then reappear later in life as shingles. So this is your classic chicken pox lesions. <coughs> what happens is when you have the chicken pox that virus is going to um, move up in the spinal nerve and basically it is going to remain latent in the dorsal root ganglion, this collection of cell bodies of the nerves, and it hangs out there. It will remain there and can be reactivated later and then move back down the spinal cord. <coughs> and in shingles, you end up with rash. So this is what shingles will look like often. It's on the side and around the back. Very painful and very long term. For a diagnosis, usually chickenpox is going to be uh, diagnosed because of the classic chickenpox lesions that you see. Shingles, because it's a rash, and it really varies uh, 
quite a bit between individuals as to how severe that rash is. So that's going to be a little more difficult to diagnose. And oftentimes initially is misdiagnosed. Chickenpox is going to run its course. I say your incubation period is 21 days. Run its course. Try not to scratch it. Uh, and it'll be self-limited. Shingles. I say the rash tends to be much more um, long term, and so you need to manage the symptoms. It can be very painful. One of the problems with the initial prevention of it is because you've got 21 days when you may not be showing any symptoms, but you are contagious. And so you're going around your your usual activities, not knowing that you're exposing others and potentially infecting others with it. There are vaccines now against chickenpox. Initially, just so you know, when they came out with the initial chickenpox vaccine, it was not that effective, but they have improved upon it, and so the effectiveness now is better. It's not 100% uh, that it will prevent it, but if you were to get chickenpox, even if you had the vaccine, then typically the symptoms would be less severe and much shorter. There's also vaccines uh, for shingles, and they, they've had a diff couple different versions of the shingles vaccine as well, uh, and they've just recently come out with a newer, new and improved version of the uh, shingles vaccine that they feel is more effective. They do not know, because the chickenpox vaccine is relatively new, came out in the 90s, they don't know if that vaccine would provide you protection against the shingles, so there's a, a separate shingles vaccine. Human herpes virus 4, also known as Epstein-Barr virus, uh, that can cause several different diseases. Um, Part of it is going to depend on how well your immune system is going to react to and fight against it. Some of the diseases of the Epsom Barr virus, uh, leukoplakia, Burkitt's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, infectious mononucleosis. So there's various different uh, diseases that it can cause. Transmission is usually via saliva. The virus is once again going to infect the bloodstream and then it's going to invade your B lymphocytes. Uh, the immune response tends to cause infectious mononucleosis, which is what happens the cytotoxic T cells are killing the B lymphocytes that are infected with the virus. In children, usually the infection is going to be asymptomatic. In adults, it produces more severe symptoms. Um, there are types of cancer that can be associated with this. There needs to be additional cofactors. So not just anyone that gets the virus is going to develop uh, cancer. There's also other factors involved with that. Treatments. Uh, oftentimes you're trying to relieve symptoms. Remember, we're talking about, about viruses, so antibiotics are not going to be effective. They're typically, uh, it depends on the disease, like Burkitt's lymphoma responds well to chemotherapy. Some of the other conditions, there is no treatment, and some of it is just you're, you're treating the symptoms, alleviating the symptoms. In terms of prevention, this virus is pretty widespread, so... Chances of it being eradicated are very slim. Human herpes virus 5, known as cytomegalovirus or CMV. Um, a lot of adults in the United States are infected. Um, in terms of the transmission of it, it requires close contact often done by uh, sexual intercourse that can be transmitted. One of the big things with CMV is that um, it can be transmitted uh, in the user's exposure. And 
the result to the developing fetus can be devastating. Most people, the infection, healthy individuals can be asymptomatic. However, if this virus um, has crossed the placenta barrier and, and infected the developing fetus, the newborn uh, may show signs of hearing damage, visual damage, uh, mental impairment, they have other signs of infection. It can be just devastating. Uh, AIDS or immunocompromised um, patients can also develop mononucleosis, pneumonia, etc. So in a healthy individual with a strong immune system, like I said, it's usually not going to be a problem. But if you're immunocompromised or newborn, like I said, this can be devastating. Diagnosis, looking for enlarged cells that have these inclusions. You can also do, viruses are often detected by ELISA tests, DNA probes. Um, in terms of treatment, um, you can use some medicine to help treat if it's with, associated with an eye infection. In terms of treating the developing fetus, you can't really do that. Newborn, um, Unfortunately, usually the damage is already done at birth. Prevention, abstinence, and safe sex practices can help uh, reduce the chances of infection. This is classically what it looks like. Human herpes virus 6. Um, this causes roseola. You typically have a, a slight rash, kind of a pinkish color rash. It can be typically on the face, it can be on the neck or on the thighs. Um, we also have herpes, um, human herpes virus 8, it's a rhabdovirus, causes Kaposi's sarcoma. This is a type of cancer that is prevalent in AIDS patients. So here's the roseola, the, the rash, and here's Kaposi's sarcoma. Papilloma viridae and polio viridae is, are both double-stranded DNA viruses. They do have very small uh, capsid. Papilloma viruses, they call papillomas, or commonly referred to as warts. Uh, they tend to start uh, growth on the epithelial of the skin or mucous membranes. Usually it's transmitted by direct contact or by fomite. Remember, an inanimate object that touches it and then, uh, then you touch it. The viruses, as the skin cells are sloughed off, then the viruses are shed. There is some uh, research that has shown that some of the human papillomaviruses may, uh, along with other factors, trigger cancer. Not necessarily by itself, but with other factors. Diagnosis is going to be by observation of the papillomas or the warts. Treatment, some warts can be removed uh, freezing chirogenically, uh, chemically. Prevention is going to be kind of difficult. There is a vaccine that's associated with some strains, such as the human papillomavirus. Poliovirus infections can cause tumors in animals and humans. Uh, Usually, a normal, healthy immune system will prevent any type of a latent infection if your immune system is compromised. However, then there often are latent infections. These infections that remain dormant, oftentimes in the kidneys. The PK virus can cause severe urinary tract infections, and the JC virus uh, tends to destroy the white matter of the central nervous system and eventually lead to death. Adenoviridae, this is a single linear uh, double-stranded DNA. You have uh, a capsid that has spikes on it. What does it cause? It's one of the causative agents of a common cold. So it's going to be spread by respiratory droplets. It can survive on fomites. 
Um, it can survive in improperly treated water, so if it's not chlorinated. Causes respiratory infections. Uh, so you can have sneezing, sore throat, coughing. Uh, if it infects the intestinal tract, you might have a very mild case of diarrhea. If it infects the conjunctiva of the eye, it will, you end up with pink eye. Their early stage of infection you can treat with gamma interferon. The, there is uh, a vaccine, but it's used typically only for military personnel. So this is what it looks like. You can see the little spikes extending out from the capsid. And, <coughs> excuse me, as you can see here, pink eyes, it's commonly referred to the conjunctivitis. Highly contagious. You rub that, touch anything else, somebody else touches it and rubs their eye, then they're going to end up with pink eye. Anyone who's had pink eye runs through their household knows how contagious that can be. Hepa DNA viridii is enveloped DNA virus. Um, this is one that's um, kind of unique that it has both single and double stranded DNA. Uh, it also does have reverse transcriptase. This is an enzyme that humans do not have. have <coughs> This does include the hepatitis B virus. Um, hepatitis, there are several different types of hepatitis virus, and hepatitis B is, is the one that is a DNA virus. So this is showing that it has a long strand and a short strand. Hepatitis B does cause hepatitis, which is inflammation of the liver. Um, it's the only DNA virus that can cause that. As we'll see later, there are several RNA viruses that can cause it, but hepatitis B is the only DNA virus. Can cause severe liver damage. Uh, there's different symptoms associated with hepatitis. Jaundice, kind of this yellowing of the skin. Because the liver is inflamed, it's going to become enlarged. That's going to cause some abdominal pain. You may have some bleeding on the skin and internal organs. Um, will there be permanent liver damage? It depends. The increased risk of that is if the patient also has hepatitis D at the same time. One thing with jaundice, you typically get kind of a yellowing color of the skin. One of the places to especially look where you see this yellowing is in the white of the eyes, which this you can see. Severe case, you can tell the skin kind of has a yellowish hue around as you look towards the nose and above the eyebrow. But one of the classic things is look at the white of the eye. If it's yellow like that, that is jaundice. I say the liver has become infected. The virus can be shown in the saliva and semen, vaginal secretions, uh, any of the body fluids. So you need to be very careful with this, uh, this spread. It can be passed during childbirth to the newborn. It can be passed through sexual intercourse. It can be passed if someone's using uh, needles and you're sharing needles. Now, initially, some individuals start out as asymptomatic or maybe very mild. It does not always progress to the very severe cases if it's just hepatitis B. You add in hepatitis D with it, and that changes everything. Uh, the number of cases has been reduced over the years because there is a vaccine for this. This vaccine was introduced in the mid to late 80s, and you can see how uh, the number of cases has dramatically decreased. So diagnosis would be by detecting the viral antigens. There's no overall effective treatment. Prevention, the vaccine has been very good. Abstinence uh, has been one of the best ways to protect against sexually transmission. There's different types of viral particles that are produced by the hepatitis uh, B virus. And this is showing some of the, the different, whether it's filamentous, whether it's spherical. There is some evidence that's showing that the hepatitis B virus may be associated with liver cancer. Um, it's not confirmed yet. 
it is known that someone who is a positive for hepatitis B, the longer you have it, so you're a chronic carrier, increase your risk for developing liver cancer. Parvoviridae is the only human pathogen that now has a single strand of DNA gene. It's the smallest of the DNA viruses that can cause a number of diseases in animals. Uh, in humans, the B19 virus causes what's classically known as the fifth disease. This causes a reddening of the skin, and being out in the sun will aggravate that condition. Uh, in this picture, you can see this little girl does have a fifth disease, uh, the reddening notice certainly along the cheeks. And finally, this table shows the various DNA viruses, the families, the strands in terms of whether it's double-stranded or single-stranded, uh, whether it's enveloped or not, relative size, and what some of the various uh, genus are in it in the disease in parentheses that it can cause.